welcome. I'm Pastor Craig Miller at Alhambra First United Methodist Church. Today is the fourth Sunday in Lent, and we'll be talking about the Messiah. Let us open up with a word of prayer. Dear God, help us to see as you see. Help us to hear as you hear. Help us to be the people you are calling us to be. Amen. Well, we're already at day 22 in our 50 Days of Jesus, and we'll be looking at Mark 8, verses 1 through 10. When I was a kid at Halston Methodist Church in Pasadena, everyone knew that Jane Kerr was the best cook in the church. And the reason why is because she baked bread every day. And there was something about going over to her house and to just smell the aroma of the bread that was in her place. Both she and Don made their bread, and it was something that they actually gave to people during Christmas and, and other holidays. And it was uh, something to behold. Fresh baked bread. Can you almost smell that right now and sort of feel the aroma in your bones there's nothing like it bread is the first word we're going to look at today bread is something that we see in all cultures around the world bread is something that sustains life it is the most common type of food that is out there and it's something which we definitely like to eat. And think about all the different kinds of bread there are. Um, there's even gluten-free bread if you want that. And so when Jesus was talking with the disciples about bread, it was something that they all were paying attention to. Let us look at this passage in Mark. About that time, when there was again a great crowd of people who had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, My heart is moved at the sight of all these people, for they have already been with me three days, and they have nothing to eat. And if I send them away to their homes hungry, they will break down on the way, and some of them have come a long distance. Where will it be possible, his disciples answered, to get sufficient bread for these people in this lonely place. How many loaves have you? he asked. Seven, they answered. Jesus told the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves, and after saying the thanksgiving, broke them and gave them to his disciples to serve out, and they served them out to the crowd. They also had a few small fish. And after he had said the blessing, he told the disciples to serve out these as well. The people had sufficient to eat, and they picked up seven loaves full of the broken pieces that were left. There were about 4,000 people. Then Jesus dismissed them. Now that story may sound familiar to you because this is the second time that Jesus has fed crowds of people. The first time he fed 5,000, and here we see that he had fed 4,000. But even in spite of this, the disciples were not quite understanding what Jesus was all about. In fact, in a few passages forward, we see the disciples in the boat being miffed with one another because there was only one piece of bread in the whole boat. And they started arguing with each other. And you can imagine their discussion, hey, why didn't you bring bread for us? Who forgot to bring the bread? Because they were obviously hungry. And it was in the midst of that that Jesus replied and told them, don't you understand what I am talking about? And later, of course, he would talk about himself as being the bread of life. And of course, on Monday, Thursday, he talks about breaking his bread as a symbol of his body being broken for us. So bread is a very powerful metaphor 
for understanding Jesus and how he gave his life for everyone and how he was giving his life to all who were following him right at that particular time. But what we see in the passages that we're looking at today is that the disciples were having a hard time understanding what exactly was going on. Our second word is sight. So I remember when I got my first pair of glasses, I was about 10 years old. Uh, there's two things that happen. One is that I began to see a lot clearer. And the second is I got called four eyes. Because <laughs> I was one of the few kids in my class that had glasses. But sight is something that we can take for granted unless we have problems with our eyes. But the sight that we're talking about here in the biblical terms is more than just what we see with our eyes. It's how do we understand what is going on? Let's take a look at this passage where Jesus heals a blind man and pay attention to what is happening in this story. Taking the blind man's hand, Jesus led him to the outskirts of the village. And when he had put saliva on the man's eyes, he placed his hands on him and asked him, Do you see anything? The man looked up and said, I see the people. For as they walk about, they look to me like trees. Do you notice something here? Does it seem like Jesus didn't have his act together? I mean... Why would he begin to heal the man and not heal him completely? Why is it that we see the man just being able to see in a blurry way where people look like trees, <laughs> where he doesn't see them with clear eyes? Well, here this story is telling us where the disciples are in the midst of the gospel of Mark. They do not have clear eyes. They do not see clearly. In fact, most of the people who are following Jesus are not too sure about him and what he was up to. The passage continues. Then Jesus again placed his hands on the man's eyes, and the man saw clearly his sight was restored, and he saw everything with perfect distinctiveness. Jesus sent him to his home and said, Do not go even in to the village. Now that we've heard this second part of the story, we can breathe a sigh of relief. Jesus hadn't lost his powers after all. He healed the man completely. And this is a metaphor again for how we understand faith and how the disciples were wrestling with faith in the Gospel of Mark. They did not completely understand the mission of Jesus. And they had a lot of preconceived notions about him. But here it says that someday they will see clearly. Although all is not known, someday they will know. The Apostle Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 12 through 13. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these, is love. I remember when I was in seminary, one of my professors talked about that as Christians we live in the in-between times. We live between the revelation of Jesus and the resurrection and the hope of him coming back again and eternal life. And so he says as a result of that we live in this in-between time where we do not know completely everything that is going to happen but we have faith in Jesus. And isn't that true for our own lives? 
How many times have you found yourselves in difficult situations and you just are not sure of where this is going to go or what is going to happen? But after the days go ahead and you look back at those events, you realize how your faith sustained you and how you grew in faith even in the midst of the adversity that you were facing. Sometimes when we have the touch of Jesus in our life, we can't see the whole picture. And it's in those times that Jesus reminds us that someday we will know the whole story. And that is one of the promises of eternity, of eternal life with Jesus. Well, what about our third word for today? Who? Who are you? Who are you trying to become? And in the context of our story, who was Jesus? Now, one of the things that I've noticed when I have uh, participated at funerals or given funerals is that when people talk about those who have passed away, they rarely talk about their accomplishments, how many years they worked in a particular position or awards that they may have won. What they really talk about is the stories about that person. A lot of times it has to do with their character, of the things that they did that helped them or assisted them or helped them to have better lives. So who has a lot to do with our character? Who we are as a person? Not our accomplishments, but how people see us and experience us in daily life. Well, we see in our passage that's upcoming how this who question related to Jesus becomes very important. Afterwards, Jesus and his disciples went into the villages around Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked the disciples this question. Who do people say that I am? John the Baptist, they answered, but others say Elijah, while others say one of the prophets. But you, he asked, who do you say that I am? To this Peter replied, you are the Christ, at which Jesus charged them not to say this about him to anyone. Then he began to teach him that the Son of Man must undergo much suffering, and that he must be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law and be put to death, and rise again after three days. He said all this quite openly, but Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Jesus, however, turning round and seeing his disciples rebuke Peter, Out of my sight, Satan, he exclaimed, for you look at things not as God does, but as people do. Well, there's a lot in this passage. The first thing we want to focus on is from this point forward, the story of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark points to Jerusalem and the cross. Jesus is making it very clear to his disciples that he is the Messiah. But not the Messiah that they may be thinking of, one that is going to come and kick out the Romans, for example, or one who is going to start his own kingdom here on earth. No, he is alluding to a different type of Messiah, the Messiah that we find in the Old Testament, the suffering servant the one who gives his life for his people. Notice what happens when he tells this, how Peter rejects the whole idea. And then Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. In other words, he's saying, 
you are not thinking correctly. You are trying to hold me back from what I need to do. And he says, because you look at things not from God's perspective, but from the perspective of people. Isn't that true in our own lives? How often do we look at things just from our own eyes, but not from the bigger picture, from God's eyes? So the question for us today is not just about whether or not we believe in Jesus, but what do we believe Jesus is? Who is Jesus? So who is Jesus to you? Is Jesus your teacher, a comforter, or your friend? Or is Jesus much more than that? Is Jesus your Messiah? The one who has come to change the world and to turn your world upside down. That you may see things as God sees not just simply as you see. As you have been immersing yourselves in these stories about Jesus, I hope you will come to understand that Jesus is more than just our friend or comforter or teacher. In fact, he is the Messiah, our Savior who saves us all for eternity. Let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before we listen to the music from Angel and Michael, let us have this benediction. Dear Jesus, help us to be the ones who touch others on your behalf. Let us be givers of hope, grace, and love in your name. Amen. Come sinners to the God. 